Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to the Booms and Busts podcast. My name is Jonathan Davis, and today is Monday, the 23rd of September 2019. So, until Saturday there, the 21st, I was suspended, or at least at Booms Busts, the Twitter account, was suspended for a week uh, from Twitter. What happened was, and I and it's on the Twitter account. I've uh, I've relayed this, but I'm reading it to you anyway because I think it's of interest, and uh, I think there's a lot to uh, take from this and uh, worry very much about um, what society is going to be like when you cannot express yourself freely, as we know is happening all over the show. A Twitterer who goes by the name of Rudy Havenstein and. The joke is that he was the the head of the Weimar German Central Bank um, when they went into hyperinflation. He just kept printing money hand over fist. Rudy tweeted a photo of common Iranians cheering when, and I'm kind of guessing here because I can't actually remember, the US killed Osama bin Laden. His was in response to some U.S. hawk saying something against Iran. Because, you know, um, there was a, a bombing of Saudi Arabian oil fields. They've absolutely accused Iran um, of doing it. So all the Americans and even Boris Johnson and Dominic Raab at the moment are, uh, are making anti-Iranian noises. I, I'm hoping to have time to come back to that later. I think Rudy's objective was to paint Iran and Iranians as okay guys, or at least spread a message of goodwill to all men, bearing in mind, of course, that all men are not good. So I responded with, and this is the exact tweet, at Rudy Havenstein, at Charlie Kirk 11, who was the other guy, Iranians are beautiful people, Let's hang some more gays and imprison more Western holidaymakers. While we're at it, give another billion to Hezbollah to murder the democratic, peace-loving Israelis. Damn those Jews. I mean Zionists. Anyone with an ounce of sense knows immediately I was trying to be sarcastic. And you will notice I didn't put any on into any intonation on my voice. I wanted it to appear as if someone was reading it. I was trying to be sarcastic. Literally within two minutes, the Twitter computer algorithm suspended my account for 24 hours. In other words, it saw stuff on there it didn't like. It immediately suspended without a human getting involved. 30 minutes later, I guess it was reviewed by a human, or in other words, a socialist woke fascist at Twitter, who must have done really well at passing exams because he's now, or she's now working at Twitter, but is clearly as brainless as... Because this person then extended the ban to one week and gave me a threat of permanent exclusion if I blah, blah, blah. So you decide. And uh, incidentally, um, there's an Australian couple... Um, by the name of Jolie King and Mark Firkin, they are now being held in Tehran's notorious Even Evin prison. Um, they were arrested uh, weeks ago near the Iranian capital. They're, uh, one of them's Australian, another one's British. And uh, guess what? They're bloggers, and they were travelling around the world to tell the world how great um, Islam is. You couldn't make it up. There are so many stories to be looked at today. One of these days, one of these podcasts, I will spend a lot of time on um, climate change uh, and all that nonsense. Um, You know, David Bellamy puts it so beautifully, of course there's climate change, but it's nothing to do with us. 2,000 years ago, Um, They were cultivating grapes for wine in the north of Scotland. Well, you know, exactly. So Greenpeace um, 
uh, put out a tweet. The last time there was this much CO2 in the atmosphere, humans didn't exist. Hashtag climate emergency. And Patrick Moore, who um, actually was one of the founders of Greenpeace, who left it many years later when it became the stupid socialist nonsense that it is now, tweeted back, So what? Primates existed, and every other family of species that is still here today. CO2 causes life, not death. How did you get it so wrong? Well, listener, socialism, that's how they got it so wrong. I note that the percent of primary energy supplied by fossil fuels in 2018, according to a BP report, in the world is now at 84.7%. Fossil fuels, as in coal, for example, uh, and oil, of course. China, 85.3%, so only slightly above the global average. USA, 84.3, slightly below. France, 51.1. Australia, 92.3. And to give some context, the UK, 79.3. I say again, the global average, if that's the right word, is 84.7. So the two outliers, on the high side, you've got Australia... On the low side, France, I bet you wouldn't have expected France to be there. The question is why? Do you know that it's actual law in Australia never to have nuclear energy? Whereas a very big proportion of French energy comes from nuclear. And um, (laughs) how on earth... Are you going to um, get the um, the emissions freedom and the carbon neutral nonsense that you want, it, even if you've signed up to the Paris Accord, if you don't use nuclear power? I'm delighted to say that in Britain's case, um, something like 18% of our power comes from nuclear and uh, when they get the new nuclear station going in, I don't know, the late 2020s, then um, hopefully we'll get mo- uh, even a higher percentage. But by then our power usage will be even greater, particularly because of electric vehicles. So I don't know why they're not already building the next nuclear power station. It's just, you know, as usual, short-termism. <sighs> Population growth. By 2050, it's only a generation from now. In Africa, they will have nine mega cities as defined by more than 10 million people, including Kinshasa in Congo, Keno in Nigeria, Abidjan in the Côte d'Ivoire, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Fascinating. All those 10 million plus cities. Fascinating. Also on the green things, think about these nonsense um, wind turbines. Decommissioned blades are notoriously difficult and expensive to transport. So they can be somewhere between 100 and 300 feet long. Nearly 100 meters long. It's amazing. Mind you, if you're Usain Bolt, you could run along it in nine seconds or whatever it is. Um, But you'd have to be pretty good on your feet to do that. Okay. So you can't transport it whole. You have to cut it up on site. And then you truck it away on a specialized lorry, which costs a lot of money. And where do you take it to? The landfill. Don't tell me that wind turbines are environmentally cool. They certainly are not. Um, For the first time since the Industrial Revolution, the UK obtains more power from clean, zero-carbon sources than fossil fuels. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, let's move on to something else. Here we are, the 23rd of September. On the 9th of September, which was in fact the date of my last podcast, I then saw a video of Lord James Blackheath in the House of Lords 
making a disturbing statement to the House. He said, and I quote, It is intended the oath of every serving member of our forces, that's our defence forces, will be cancelled and they will be required to set to undertake a new oath of loyalty to Brussels in the new European Defence Force, which we know is coming. We should all be distressed by this. Note, there was lots of tut-tutting and, oh, it's terrible, from the House when he said it. How dare you say such things? It's not true. Well, here we are two weeks later, and it has not been refuted outside. Of course, the media don't mention it again, nor does any politician. So, of course, it's categorically true. Now, on this month in history, September the 16th, 1998, officials at long-term capital management on Wall Street, or in fact in Connecticut, actually, where all the hedge funds are, they contacted the New York Fed, the, one of the 12 regional offices of the Federal Reserve, to say that the firm was in trouble, ha! to put it mildly. Now, this set off um, a, a series of quick-fire phone calls around Wall Street, and Wall Street knew that because of the spider's way of, of connections, that LTCM had throughout the global financial system, they knew if they let LTCM go down, it would bring down the global financial system. So, something like a dozen big banks got together $4 billion. $4 billion! What a vast, a vast amount of money! And they literally plugged all the holes. And over the next roughly a year, year and a half, they cleared it all. It took that time to get out of all the positions. And the global financial system was saved. Yay. What happened 10 years later? It ha the, the collapse of the global financial system had moved from one individual hedge fund to every blooming bank in the world. And it didn't take four billion dollars. I'll tell you, for example, the balance sheet or the amount that the Federal Reserve printed, the balance sheet of the Fed went from 800 billion to over 4,000 billion. Not four billion, no, three thousand odd billion is what it took to sort out the US banking system at the time, as well as 800 billion of what they call uh, TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. In other words, there was socialism for the ultra, ultra, ultra rich, while the rest of us had creative destructive capitalism. We had the invisible hand of capitalism, but not the ultra-rich. They were bailed out by everyone else. And it wasn't just $4 trillion. Globally, you could say $30,000 billion has been handed to bankers over the last 10, 11 years. And the next calamity will be at the uh, government level. So, hedge fund, 10 years later, global banking, the next level be, will be at the government level. Now, all I'm doing is relating to you what uh, the, your man Jim, Jim's, Jim Rickards says. And it's a good story, except for one thing. I can tell you that in 2016, and 2017, and 2018, that guy must have said, I would imagine, 250 times to anyone who would listen, 
um, in the press, in the media, in the TV, in the uh, alt media, you name it, he must have said it in speeches to millions and millions of folk. Nin- tw- uh, 1998, 2008, so it's pretty obvious that the next one will be 2018. Well, it came and it went. But he sold a shed load of books, didn't he? And I heard him say it again recently. He says, I don't know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen, and it's going to happen exactly like that. Go and buy his books. Do you think he gives a damn about anyone when he's writing these books? He doesn't give a damn about anyone, about anyone's wealth, except his own. Now, on this month in history, the 11th of September, 2001. Never forget. 19 Muslim men hijacked four aeroplanes. They were inspired by their prophet and they were driven by jihadist ardor. They sought to destroy the symbols of American success, of Western success, of democratic success. The Twin Towers, the Pentagon and the White House. In total, 2,996 people lost their lives, of which 343 were firefighters. Two days later, there's a photo on the 13th of September, and you've got uh, four people sitting on the veranda at Camp David, drinking cocktails and smoking cigars. Dick Cheney, the Foreign Minister of Saudi Arabia, Bandar, Condoleezza Rice, and George Bush. As former FBI agent Mark Rossini said, any letting the Saudis off the hook came from the White House. I can still see that photo of Bandar and Bush enjoying cigars on the balcony, I said Camp David, of the White House two days after 9-11. And remember this as well. With the help of America's politicians, the 9-11 terrorists managed to eviscerate the Bill of Rights. Meanwhile, the feds got all they wanted, more taxpayer money, more power, more untrammeled authority to imprison, spy, tax, search and control. So, talking about the Saudis, about a week ago, Saudi oil facilities were blown up. Half of their production was taken out, which is 5% of world production. The Saudis said this was like their 9-11. Well, actually, so was the first one. Gary Grappo, the former US ambassador to Oman has said on camera, I think the Saudi leadership has a great deal of explaining to do. That a country that ranks third in terms of total defence spending was not able to defend its most critical oil facility from these kinds of attacks. And the US has sent troops to Saudi Arabia to help. And Boris and Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, are going to do the same. Excuse me! Why on earth are we going to fight their battles? They're saying it was Iran who did it. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But it's obviously to start a war between us and Iran. What the hell has it got to do with us? Edward Snowden. He tweeted, The government of the United States has just announced a lawsuit over my memoir, permanent record, which was just released last week, worldwide. This is the book the government does not want you to read. Here is the opening page. My name is Edward Joseph Snowden. I used to work for the government, but now I work for the public. It took me nearly three decades to recognize that there was a distinction. And when I did, It got me into a bit of trouble at the office. 
As a result, I now spend my time trying to protect the public from the person I used to be, a spy for the Central Intelligence Agency and National Security Agency. Just another young technologist out to build what I was sure would be a better world. My career in the American intelligence community only lasted a short seven years, which I'm surprised to realize is just one year longer than the time I've spent since in exile in a country that wasn't my choice. During that seven-year stint, however, I participated in the most significant change in the history of American espionage, the change from the targeted surveillance of individuals to the mass surveillance of entire populations. I helped make it technologically feasible for a single government to collect all the world's digital communications, store them for ages, and search through them at will. Perhaps that's a book you might want to go and read. Nikki Haley, the ex-ambassador for the US to the United Nations, and Donald Trump were great, great, great friends of peace-loving, democratic Israel in the United Nations. Pamela Geller, who is the new US ambassador to the UN, has a message for the anti-Semitic world body. Her tweet, Israel will have no better friend than myself. You think you're safe from tech spies? Google says it takes their new quantum pr processor 200 seconds to make calculations that existing supercomputers re require around 10,000 years to perform. The processor, based on quantum mechanics, requires a mere 30 seconds to complete a task the Google Cloud server would need 50,000 billion hours to do. 30 seconds. The power of technology is beyond what you can even imagine. We are no longer safe. And it may not massively affect us um, oldies, but what of our kids and our grandkids? Think long and hard. Thomas Cook, which started as the as a travel agent to people who didn't drink alcohol, it's true, around um, 1850, the first travel agent in the world. It's just gone bust again. It's got uh, massive liabilities, trade credits, long-term borrowings, over a billion pounds in bo uh, uh, trade credits and borrowings. That's two billion. Um, pension deficit of half a billion. Intangible assets, apparently, of two billion pounds. So you think, well, that's all right. Except that one and a half billion of that is goodwill, which, when it goes to insolvency, will go to zero. And you've got top people in Labour Party and trades unions. You've got the mayor of Manchester saying, oh, it's, the government's disgusting. They should bail them out. Well, first of all, they gave them £300 million only three or four months ago which should not have happened, obviously. Rebecca Long Bailey of Labour says, staff employed by Thomas Cook are threatened with redundancy while British holidaymakers risk left being stranded overseas. 
the government failed to inject the £200 million needed to save the company and now it faces a £600 million bill bill to repatriate holidaymakers. Disgraceful. Well, clearly socialists don't understand the real world. And she clearly has never looked at a balance sheet in her life. Talking about socialism, communism killed 70 million folk in China. Over 20 million in the Soviet Union. Almost one in three Cambodians. Communists enslaved nations in Russia, Vietnam, China, Eastern Europe, North Korea, Cuba, Central Asia. Why isn't communism as hated as Nazism? Why is it we get program after program about the disgusting Nazis? Not a sausage about communism. Hilar Neuer, who is um, a guy who, co- who says of himself he's fighting dictatorships and double standards. He's an international lawyer and human rights activist. He's an executive director of UN Watch. He's got one, two, three, four degrees and a doctorate. He tweets... On the, inter- on the hashtag International Day of Democracy, I'm celebrating here in Geneva with my good friends, members of the UN Human Rights Council. And he lists them. Saudi Arabia, China, Cuba, Somalia, Pakistan, Iraq, Qatar, Eritrea, Congo, Bangladesh, Cameroon. You get the point? Yesterday, or a couple of days ago in France, which is the home of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for the 45th Saturday in a row, the GA Jaune, the Yellow Vests, were demonstrating, were protesting in the stunning silence of the media. You know, you notice that list that I just read out of the countries in the human. Uh, Human Rights Agency, the Human Rights Council. These countries' laws call to kill gays. Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Nigeria, Qatar. These countries sit on the UN Human Rights Council. Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Nigeria and Qatar. What a joke, the United Nations. After 40 years at the BBC, John Humphreys, the top BBC journalist, retires. And he's decided to lift the lid two days after he retired on the BBC. He says it suffers from an institutional liberal bias. Obviously, he's selling a book. He accuses it of being a Kremlin-style organisation and out of touch. Its bosses, quote, badly failed, unquote, to read the nation's mood on Europe and, quote, simply could not grasp, unquote, why anyone voted leave. Huh, what a shocker. Why on earth, Mr. Humphreys, did it take you 40 years? Why did you not resign? Especially given the BBC's destructive and disastrous framing of the Brexit debate. How could you swallow what you had to do on a daily basis? I'll give you the reasons, listener. Between 400,000 and 410,000 pounds a year. Those were the reasons. The world and history will not look upon you kindly, Mr. John Humphreys. Boris Johnson should break the law. The Ben Act is a coup d'etat orchestrated by the anti-Brexit faction in Parliament to subvert the clearly expressed will of the people. Boris has to break the law to restore the proper constitutional relationship between government, Parliament and the people. In 1635, the MP John Hamden refused to pay the ship money tax, a levy collected by Charles I for outfitting his navy because it had not been agreed by Parliament and was unlawful. 
the row led to revolt that overthrew the Stuart monarchy. On December the 16th, 1773, the Sons of Liberty, a group opposed to colonial rule in America, broke into ships owned by Britain's East India Company to destroy a shipment of tea by throwing it into the Boston Harbour, the Boston Tea Party. They were protesting against a British levy on tea because they believed there should be no taxation without representation. Their actions led directly to the rebellion that overthrew the colonial government in America. By the way, the level of the tax they hated? 3%. These acts were both successful because their law-breaking was supported by the will of the people. Mahatma Gandhi, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya in the 50s and 60s, they all broke British imperial law, but they had the moral right to do so since they represented the people. Also Nelson Mandela in South Africa, Martin Luther King, the suffragettes, They broke the law of the day and it led to change because it had the support of the people. There is no doubt that the pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong have been breaking laws. But they're justified because the vast numbers involved show they represent the will of the people. The equally courageously. The movement for democratic change in Zimbabwe engaged in protests illegal under the laws against the murderous tyranny of that bastard Robert Mugabe. If Boris were to break the law, it wouldn't take physical courage, merely moral courage. There are sometimes, thankfully not many, moments in history of a country when bad laws must be broken to get something vital done. Those who murdered Anne Frank broke no laws. Those who protected her broke many laws. Talking about lawbreakers, I've been watching the Labour Party conference where basically they've decided to ban everything except anti-Semitism. First, it's the independent schools. Suppose we had a society in which there were two ways to get on in the world. One, be born into a connected family. Or two, buy an education that includes connections. And they're banning number two. They're reducing social mobility. That's what socialists do. They support the elite against the people. Next, it will be independent health care. Then it will be industries. Then your homes. Finally, it will be your minds. Trump has been doing fundraisers with 50 to 100,000 people turning up at a time. Obama never got those numbers. Trump, however, has been doing it again and again. Any media mention? (laughs) Stupid question. Trump is more popular in the polls than Obama at the same point after three years or so. Trump will win 2020 by a landslide, all other things being equal. A week is a long time in politics. Just going back to the Labour Party. In 1924, Oswald Mosley was elected as a Labour Party MP. In 1926, he was elected again, standing for Labour in a different constituency. He then formed the Fascist Party, pushing anti-Semitism and Jew hatred. Some things never change. Hashtag... Labour Conference 2019. Do you know, it's too bad that the hijab and the niqab aren't mandatory in Israel. Nothing of that order is mandatory in Israel. 
by the way, because if it were, the so-called progressive left feminists would be all over it. The labor idiots are calling for reparation for slavery. Let me tell you this, in 1833, I've discussed this at length um, on these podcasts. Britain used 40% of its national budget to buy freedom for all slaves right across the empire. 40% of the annual spending that year. We only spend, what is it, 20 or so percent on the NHS. Britain borrowed such a large amount of money for the Slavery Abolition Act that we didn't pay it off, listen, until 2014, nearly 200 years. That's how much we borrowed to free the slaves. This means, of course, that living British citizens helped pay for the ending of the slave trade reparations. It's just more taxes. That's all it is. You know, of course, momentum is hard, hard, hard left. I mean, serious communist fascists. It's unbelievable. Um, and they basically run, of course they do, they run labor. So um, uh, a week or so ago, Momentum Bolton tweeted, Tonight we're holding a meeting to plan our campaign against voters' ID. A shocking attempt by the Tories to subvert democracy in the UK. 6pm at the Socialist Club, members only. Please bring your membership card. The most recent and remarkable example of MPs acting for straight to frustrate our exit was Jeremy Corbyn's Surrender Act, supported enthusiastically by Labour and Liberal Democrat MPs and passed by tar Parliament. It is explicitly designed to undermine the Prime Minister's efforts to honour the referendum result. It seeks to mandate the government to accept whatever deal Brussels demands. It says the Prime Minister must ask the EU to keep us as a member until we agree the terms it dictates for our departure. In the centuries of our history, I can think of no parallel for this sort of vote. Never before in hundreds and hundreds of years has Parliament instructed a Prime Minister to accept whatever foreign powers demanded. The MPs behind this act claim to be acting in the name of democracy. But when they were asked if we could let the people decide if they were right, in other words, have a general election, they refused. Twice. Julian Assange is facing 200 years in prison. Well, obviously he's not. He's facing actual life in prison because he decided that people should know about the horrific crimes our governments commit to maintain their power. And he was not as clued in as Edward Snowden, so he couldn't run and hide. I see that um, the GDP per capita uh, in Luxembourg is the highest in the EU. It's 150% um, more than the GDP per capita in France, for example. And it's 100% um, more than even the Netherlands. Why am I telling you this? Well, for every um, pound that Luxembourg gives to Brussels, it gets 30 pounds back. For every pound that France hands in, 
it gets 56 pence back. The Netherlands gets 53 pence back. How much does the UK get back? 38 pence. One, two, three, four, five, six and a half. I've got six and a half pages on that gruesome beast, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, his main recruiter of young girls um, to be abused in really out terrible, terrible ways. Uh, Glenn Maxwell um, is Robert Maxwell's daughter. Like father, like daughter. I'm not going to read six and a half pages today. I'm going to read a section today. And I'm going to read more in the next podcast. It might take me three or four podcasts. It, I'm largely reading from the Miami Herald. For two decades, Jeffrey Epstein built a sex trafficking enterprise that reached across state borders in the US and spanned the globe. Using an almost bottomless quarry of wealth and connections, he not only employed recruiters around the world, but enlisted the help of an array of seemingly legitimate people, from hairdressers to psychiatrists to immigration lawyers, to dentists, even doctors, doctors who prescribed his victims birth control and screened them for sexually transmitted diseases. Many of his survivors were underage, and in America that's 18 is the age of consent, However, there were countless others who were 18 to 23, a group of women who have been reluctant to come forward because despite the ordeal they went through, they are ashamed and believe that the public doesn't look upon them as victims at all. A closer look at Epstein's sex trafficking operation sheds new light on how the billionaire and his accomplices, don't forget that, his many, many, many accomplices perfected a process to sexually exploit and abuse young women that was so organized and so apparently acceptable to many of those around Epstein that his victims, even those above the age of consent, came to believe that it was almost normal. Sarah Ransom, a native of South Africa, who successfully sued Epstein and his then-partner, the British Ghislaine Maxwell, in 2017 for trafficking her when she was 22. Sarah Ransom. Not one person helped us. Everyone around us had to know, because we looked so broken, but no one did anything. There are few people who understand Epstein's intricate web of accomplices and enablers more than Bradley Edwards, the attorney who brought a lawsuit against the Justice Department after federal prosecutors in South Florida, led by then Miami U.S. Attorney Alexander Acosta, gave Epstein an unusually lenient plea deal way back in 2008. Remember that name, Bradley Edwards, the lawyer. To understand how women above the age of consent could get trapped in Epstein's network requires understanding what Edwards calls Epstein's process, the psychology behind a sex predator mastermind who homed in on the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities of his targets. Do any of you have daughters? I know I do. Edward said he would find out they have no home, no car, that they need a place to live, 
and he would provide a place to live. He can get you to the best doctors. Sometimes he would do that and sometimes he wouldn't. But the promise was real because as soon as you walk into his palatial home and see there are legitimate cooks, chefs, butlers, assistants, everyone catering to him, it gives this air of legitimacy. I mean, everybody in this whole entire mansion can't possibly be running an illegal sex trafficking operation, right? Virginia Geoffrey, who was recruited by Epstein when she was 16 and stayed with him until 19, said that Epstein promised, quote, to fix, unquote, anything that was wrong in their lives, offering to pay for their education and help them with their careers. And he demonstrated that he had the power to accomplish that. Then there were the enablers. Virginia Guffrey details a plan she said that Ghislaine Maxwell had to have her have a baby for Maxwell and Epstein. The conversation took place after a day of snorkeling near Epstein's private island in the US Virgin Islands. There were doctors and psychiatrists and gynecologist visits. There were dentists who whitened our teeth. There was a doctor who gave me Xanax. What doctor in their right mind who is supposed to protect people gives girls and young women Xanax, Geoffrey said. Sarah Ransom said at one point when she was on the verge of a breakdown, Epstein sent her to a psychiatrist to whom she confided about the abuse. Well, you would, wouldn't you? The psychiatrist did nothing except put her on lithium. I find it so funny. With all these people, after Jeffrey was arrested, saying, we didn't know. We didn't see anything. Jeffrey was always surrounded by girls, always. And these weren't aunt normal girls. You could see it in our faces. We were damaged. We were medicated. How can you sit in front of a group of girls with Jeffrey and say, we just didn't know. You had to know. I'll read more another time. Monstrous, huh? Um, what have I got in economics? Before that, yeah, uh, Booms and Bust Report will be coming out shortly. Um, if you don't receive it, it's free. Um, just go on to jonathandaviswm.com and click subscribe to the Booms and Bust Report. It, it, it will have, I'm in the process of writing it, it will have, as usual, some really important commentary on um, long-term investing. In case you're new to the Booms and Bust podcast, um, the easiest way in future to get this podcast, if you wish to, is go on to audioboom.com, uh, click listener, search for Booms and, that's all you have to write, it will show up in the list, um, click on it, click subscribe, it'll be sent to you anytime in future I publish a new podcast. The Telegraph did a big piece at the weekend on buy to letters need to get out of the market because next April the taxes on buy to let are going to soar. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, apart from anything, it's too funny because people like me have been saying this for the last three years and the taxes have been soaring for the last two years. And the Telegraph are writing it um, now. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, buy to let um, has made a lot of people a lot of money. But, um, well, there are so many problems with A, that, and B, um, house prices anyway. Um, I've talked about it enough. If we're in an era of rising interest rates, etc., etc., 
Uh, what will I say about the markets? Can you just stop with the it's 10 years since the last bear market nonsense? <laughs> right, hands up if you know what the definition of a stock's bear market is. And I'll bet pretty well all of you have put up your hand saying, oh, well, it's when markets fall 20%. That listener is as nonsensical as saying we have an economic recession because we've had two consecutive quarters of a falling economy. Are you telling me that it's a recession if the economy goes down consecutively 0.1%? For two quarters? Is that a recession? Of course not. Especially if for the whole year the economy goes up 1% or something like that. It's not a recession. Well, let me tell you that in 2011, I mean, okay, 10 years, everyone's talking about 2008. Obviously, it's 11 years now. What the hell? In 2011, the S&P 500 fell. You're listening 19.4%. Is that not a stock market crash? Is that not a bear market? Because it's 0.6% away from this mythical 20%? Of course it's a bear market. Similarly, in 2018, just last year, from top to bottom, the stock market, the S&P 500, fell 19.8%. We have had two bear markets. In the last 10 years. Boxing Day 2018 was the start of a new bull market, listener. So if you're one of those people who has been um, brainwashed into having a, 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 a low risk, whatever they call it, nonsense investment portfolio because there's just about to be another bear market, well, I'm sorry, but you are the patsy, like on the poker table. If you don't know who the patsy is, it's you. You are the patsy. God, the number of people I see who've got uh, um, diversified portfolios because there's just about to be another crash who are, who are up to here with government bonds as we're raising interest rates or interest rates are raising anyway. You are the patsy. I've talked about gold and commodities, uranium a lot. Yeah, okay, 54 minutes. Let's dive straight into uh, some interesting quotes and statements. Yeah, I say one day I'm going to do a big thing on uh, the whole climate change thing, but David Bellamy, one of the nicest, smartest guys on the planet. He's an old man now, but he used to be huge on BBC television until... He said that the climate change caused by man was nonsense. He was gone. You never saw him again in the media. Here's a quote from the great David Bellamy. Global warming is part of natural cycle and there's nothing we can actually do to stop these cycles. The world is now facing spending a vast amount of money in tax to try to solve a problem that doesn't actually exist. Listener, I'm telling you, it's all about socialism and the multinationals and the elite. They're getting us to spend more taxes that they will make more and more and more billions on. And the socialists, of course, will get themselves elected on this climate change nonsense. 2,000 years ago, they were growing vines for wine in the north of Scotland. For goodness sake, it's climate change and it's nothing to do with us. 16-year-olds can't drive, can't buy tobacco, can't buy alcohol, can't buy fireworks, can't view internet porn, <laughs> if only can't get a tattoo, can't go to a casino, can't serve on a jury, can't make a will, and yet they can advise world leaders on climate policy. Hashtag climate strike. Show me a school kid that wants the heating turned down. He's willing to walk to school. We'll never go on a jet plane for a holiday. 
and they will eat seasonal root vegetables and I'll let them lecture my generation on the climate. The US tax body, the Internal Revenue Service, has in their tax code you may be eligible to file, to file, in other words, claim against your income to reduce your tax as head of the household, even if your child, who is your qualifying person, has been kidnapped. For more information, see pub.501. Well, I'm so glad that's cleared up. Patience, we know, is a virtue. Jacob Rees of the San Antonio Spurs of the NBA. When nothing seems to help, I go and look at a stone cutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times with as, without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet, at the hundred and first blow, it will split in two. And I know it was not that last blow that did it, but all that had gone before. Brilliant. Now, here at the Booms and Busts podcast, we want to help you with your interior designing. Did you know that you can convert your sofa into a sofa bed quickly and easily by simply forgetting your wife's birthday? Yes. And my wife says, I have only two faults. One, I don't listen. And two, some other crap she was prattling on about. And on that sexist and terrible human being note, I thank you again for listening. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.